Hello, everybody. Welcome to the What Culture Gaming Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Tilford, joined by Ben Roy Turner. Hello there. And Josh Brown. Hello there. Chaps, I don't know how much time you've spent ruminating on the fact that the final PS4 exclusive is out, but every, for everybody else, we thought we would go through and just sort of rank the best PS4 exclusives of the entire generation, because as far as Sony's concerned, their output is done. It's the end of an era. And now we've got quite a lot to pick from. So um, we've put together our top five individual top fives. And then we're going to do a handful of um, picking some specific games to break down after that. Um, so, Mr. Uh, Benroy, your top five in descending order uh, from five to one is Ooh. Bloodborne, Until Dawn, God of War, Death Stranding, and The Last of Us 2 at number one. And we're going to get back to The Last of Us 2 and Until Dawn in a bit. Uh, Josh Brown, your number five was Spider-Man, followed by God of War, Death Stranding, Bloodborne, and The Last of Us Part 2. Uh, and for you, we're going to get to Death Stranding and Bloodborne. Um, and for me, it was Horizon Zero Dawn, The Last of Us Part 2, Ghost of Tsushima, Death Stranding, and God of War, um, with my two picks being God of War and Tsushima to focus on later. But I thought out of all of those games, we should talk about Death Stranding, because that's the one that even we've kind of forgotten about a couple of times. And then when it yeah. comes back up, it's like, oh my God, this thing happened. This thing was a yeah. big old deal. Totally. I, I, feel, I just want to say that um, although I had Spider-Man at number five on my thing, you that changed was pretty it again. Much a, a, no, it's pretty much a stand-in for everything because I had a solid top four, but there have been so many great PlayStation 4 exclusives that mm. I couldn't get a fifth. So Spider-Man's there, but by the end of the year, that could change to Uncharted 4. It could change <laughs> to Until Dawn. It could change to Ghost of Tsushima because mm -hmm. there are so many um, great games vying for that spot. But yes, Death Stranding is the one that kind of stands out because like you said it's a strange game we have had this discussion many times over the past few months um, about what is going to be our favorite um playstation 4 exclusive and mm -hmm. i feel like we, we always forget about it but then as soon as someone mentions it it's like that was awesome that is definitely going to be top three at least for, mm -hmm. for me it is because that game left such an impression and i think part of the reason i forget it is because i essentially binged it in a week and a half <laughs> played almost 60 hours of it within a ridiculous time period considering that you know we have jobs and we had other things to do back then mm -hmm. uh and yet it it made such an impression in that time i just did not want to do anything other than eat drink and breathe that game i remember very vividly having to go to ikea and getting very <laughs> annoyed on launch weekend getting very annoyed that i couldn't play the game and i came back and Hammered it. Do you remember that, that launch week, sorry. though, where it was just, we weren't doing anything other than talking about Death Stranding, counting yes. down the hours of work till we can go home and play more Death Stranding? There's something about certain games that I think just latch on like that, where it just takes over your entire life. And although I really, really didn't like the ending, um, and I, I, I had a whole thing about like feeling embarrassed that I ever cared in the first place, I still totally champion that game's gameplay and the characters and everything else. Um, Benroy, how did you come down on, on the whole feeling of Death Stranding? Death Stranding was more of a moment than a game for me. It sort of consumed <laughs> me in every way. And I, uh, like Brown, I got I would get annoyed if I couldn't play that. But get, for me, getting annoyed by not playing that, that was mm -hmm. me going to the toilet. I wasn't going to have to go to Ikea. No one was getting in the way of me playing that game. I'm getting someone to deliver, deliver food to me because I'm trying to reconnect America. And I did that. <laughs> and I did it all within four human days. I had to... I remember being the first one to be a curse of knowledge, waiting mm -hmm. for people to like get. Because you were the first one finished, yeah. I just, I just remember finishing it like it's four in the morning, just like sitting there, like I'm so happy but sad, and I just want to cry. <laughs> and unlike say like the last of us two, which also consumed uh, us for a amount of time, mm -hmm. this was pleasant but yet mysterious. And saying, I, I just haven't played anything like it. Not even Metal Gear 5, to be fair. No. Like, I've not played anything as weird or as I, I, you, Kojimri. That's going to just be how I'm going to refer to it. He does need his own term, to be yeah. fair. Do you think going forward... The, the whole gem. Um, do you think he did sort of create a new genre, the whole Strand game thing? Or do you think that was more of like a marketing... But Do you think developers will take stuff from Death Strand and go forward? I think it is, is this idea of people within your world. I think it's taking, I, can't, I always remember, forget that game. Was it Fable 3 when you have like the dots going around the world? And you know, people like. did that. Yeah, like to represent yeah. multiplayer. Yeah. And I def and not Death Stranding, Dark Souls, where you can leave messages. I like the idea of knowing people are in your world mm. and that sort of like persistent and branching off more that way. But mm. Stranding games are really a genre if we think about it. I think it's just the quirky multiplayer stuff that you're putting in it. I don't know about you two. 
Well, I thought I thought there was enough there. Like, um, yeah, that idea of like group building something, like you sort of in in Death Stranding's case, like you help put a bunch of materials into like a motorway that's coming together, or you know, you help build like a comm station, and you know that someone out there will get some benefit from it, um, and you are sort of like asynchronously moving forward together. I love the feeling of that, and you can't really replicate it in any other medium, um, and hardly any other games either. Like Dark Souls gets close to it when you're reading each other's messages and stuff, um, but you're not climbing a mountain easier because someone's left you a ladder or something like that. Can um, I that feeling was so good. I keep forgetting the likes and the whole thing of yeah. I was so I got so much pleasure out of building roads for people and building things and knowing people that were going to use my zip lines. Mm -hmm. I forgot that aspect of the game and that as well. Like that was that became addictive. Yeah. That and trying to find Sam Lake, the little bugger. Eventually I got him in the end. But the whole <laughs> like system, that was really good as well. Yeah, that whole weird side of like Sam Lake, Jeff Keighley, um, was it Jordan Vote Roberts? They just that the yeah. whole media event that was Death Stranding, the whole album that came out, like Luden's Bring Me the Horizons, yeah. new single and everything. Yeah. Um yeah, Josh, what what would you think of all that stuff? <laughs> I remember um, like going to one of the uh the places and activating it for the seventh for the first time and Edgar Wright popped up and I was like, <laughs> yes. on, no, he, he can't be in this as well. Baby driver and all of those little poppers. It was like a it's a distinctly Hideo Kojima game, but I mm. don't. I feel like it's a well done one. Mm. I was so surprised about how engaged with the story I was, and I know that you dropped off, Scott. But I mm. think you would have to kind of agree that, in terms of like direction and presentation, and the way that he filmed scenes, it was so. I, at least I thought it was so inventive the way oh, the yeah. camera work kind of evoked that mystery that Ben Rory was talking about, and the fear of what the hell is going on in this creative world. I thought the atmosphere was just kind of unparalleled, and like yeah, like you said combine that with the really inventive and really satisfying multiplayer component. It's one of the only games that's had this social element that's also managed to make it feel intentionally lonely. Like the first time you go through areas, I think it's a great decision that you can't rely on anyone else's structures. You have to make your own. And then when you connect it, you're suddenly open to this web of other players and the things they've built and it makes your life easier. And it mm. does feel like you are this kind of person out there single-handedly doing something, but then connecting to a wider community and you feel that through the players rather than you do through the npcs like it's just for people take the piss out of it and call it you know like a, a crappy old walking simulator or all you're doing is delivering parcels and i feel like that's such a reductive thing you can do that to literally any game you can yeah. be like doom is just a game about pointing clicking on demons and jumping away and i feel like you know death stranding yeah did this kind of like weird walking sim delivery thing but it made that engaging in the way that it like um designed its world the way that it designed its mechanics and yeah you were pray, playing uh, left and right on the left and right triggers quite a lot mm -hmm. but it, it was it was much more than that like the mechanics were so much more robust and interconnected and it made it feel satisfying the act of getting around the game space was interesting and ultimately like that's what i look for in open world games especially trying to master a space whether it's you know the interconnected levels in dark souls or the mansion of resident evil one that's part of the fun and i think over this generation especially, that element has kind of been lost in a lot of sandbox games. Mm. And Death Stranding just kind of embraced it and was like, nah, you need to figure out a way from point A to B. We're going to make it engaging. Yeah, man. And like the reward systems are insane as well. Like, I mean, like, Ben Roy, I know you got the platinum, but it's like every NPC that you talk to, if you do the missions for yeah. them, you get way better gear. Like, it's just, it gives you a good reason to do everything, like every last, um, you know, every last sort of side quest. Um, we can also uh, pivot across too, because I mentioned my uh, first game was going to be God of War. Um, that for me, yeah, is my number one. I was, I, a few games this generation I've thought are legitimately perfect. There's not a single pixel voxel. Uh, scene I would change whatsoever with God of War and even in like a meta sense I love that they made something that sort of maturely addresses what God of War is like making it so that Kratos has an anger problem and that his sort of rage spikes with this rage meter on screen but he's also learning to be a better father and he's kind of like remorseful about what he's done and he knows that he's this brutal one-dimensional killer or he used to be and he's trying he's like growing up and realizing that in a meta sense like for the developers to do that as well that's the thing that elevates God of War for me um but i mean but i don't know ben Roy, were you a fan of god of war back in the day i know josh didn't play many of them uh the older ones yeah. i sat and played there were the games i i played with a friend and i i don't know why i always think about this but i always refer god of war to like a, the experience i had with the scorpion king game just like <laughs> i would pick it up bash a few people about and then put it down so yeah. i wasn't going into this one expecting much and I was totally taken by surprise. And I, it turns out I love throwing an axe at people and just beating them up. Mm -hmm. Oh man, the, the, um, the Leviathan axe thing, the physics just on that, considering that like the chain, uh, the chains of Olympus were this 
big build beforehand, um, going down the axe route. I remember when I first saw that, like leading up to launch, I wasn't massively bothered about it because I didn't feel like you could do it. I didn't realize they were going to do this whole like complete shift of what Kratos, who Kratos is and what God of War is. I thought it was just going to be more God of War, which I was like totally sick of God of War 3. Um, Josh, I don't know if you, did you like bounce off the series because it was so ridiculous and over the top back in the 2000s? Yeah, that's pretty much it. I know there was like a a lot of appeal for that stuff like back in the day. I just kind of found it a little bit impenetrable. Like I'm sure Mm. it was fun. I've only really played a bit of two and I know a lot about three from like watching critiques and stuff, but it was never, Mm. it was never my thing. It's not that I was like wanting really complex characters or anything, but I just felt like it lacked, I don't know, it just lacked a, a hook to it, if that makes sense. Like mechanically, it was very satisfying, but I didn't care for the world, I didn't care for Kratos, didn't care for the characters. Like in general, Greek mythology isn't necessarily my thing anyway. So when it was Ooh. when there was a oh. shift to um, Norse mythology uh-huh. and we got this kind of new, um, kind of more intimate combat system, that was something that appealed to me as well. I didn't like the pulled back nature in a, to a lot of um, God of War's previous God of War games as action. Like, I thought that kind of made it feel less tactile, less tactile even though mm-hmm. it was very spectacular. So kind of bringing it in closer, both, you know, literally and metaphorically to the character and analysing what the series was, that appealed to me. And I think they pulled it off in just such a marvellous way. Like, I had no affection for this world, and yet I left just caring so much about, you know, Kratos and his journey with Atreus and the overall landscape and, you know, tapestry that are wove with the new characters that are brought. But most importantly, it gave me a reverence for the original. Like when he goes, well, spoilers, when, when, when the Blades of Chaos, you know, come into play and mm-hmm. all the elements from the series come into play or are hinted at, um, like even though I had no real frame of reference for that stuff, I still felt it. And I thought if, if it's made me feel some kind of, like I said, reverence for that past iconography and mythology, it must be doing something right. And I am, even though it's only like number four on my list, I think it's just you know, like a nine out of 10 game. So incredibly solid. Like, a nine? I'm not a fan. Well, it's also. Yeah, very few things are a 10 out of 10, Scott of Kelford, you know. <laughs> no very, wrong. very few. I was going to say, the weapons, there's also the best case I found in a game where you have to use one weapon for one thing and one for another. Normally I'm like, Ugh, or normally, like say in certain games that I'm playing at the moment, where I've got a switch stance to press the same button to just do the same thing to a different person. Oh, it's I a get, different thing. I get re- <laughs> it's just the point. like, okay, give video games, but the the Blades of Chaos and the Leviathan Axe. I like the the fire and ice element to it. And I like mm-hmm. how how they are so different, and you need switching to them feels so like kinetic, and you just need to do it to get through the game and mm-hmm. the fact that they only come in halfway through and i wasn't getting bored of the axe and then they throw the blades at me i'm like yes let's go i think with the blades is like because like i said like thematically like that's the part of him that I, I adore the the metaphor of him building his new house on top of the blades of chaos or when he moved in he put them underneath the house and where he was living with freya but when you go back to get those chains i didn't want to use them because i know what he left behind so that whole side of it for me i focused on the leviathan axe i'd only used the chains when i absolutely needed to um but did that just land differently for you both because you didn't have the sort of like the whole background of like him being this overblown like teenage angst tood guy like, I, I, think, I was like, you've moved on from this. I think it still works. Obviously, you had a deeper connection to that moment. But I think, you know, the reputation of God of War is there. If you're into video games, mm-hmm. if you're into Sony's video games especially, you know the reputation of Kratos. He was like this big deal. He has this reputation, even if you don't play the games, of being this kind of meathead and kind of like almost <laughs> a tragic figure, I guess, with mm-hmm. his family and stuff. And you do get an, a sense of what those blades mean within the context of the game to the point where I was a bit like you, Scott. I kind mm-hmm. of... I could tell it was such a weighty moment. I could tell that these things had history. It was part of this person he was trying to leave behind or move on from. So even though I didn't, I hadn't played the other games, I still found myself favoring the Leviathan Axe, the, the Leviathan Axe, because of the thematics that were embedded into mm-hmm. how these weapons meant something to this character. It's the bit oh, the very. I was just, just super quickly. It's the yeah. bit at the very beginning where his bandages fall off, and you realize mm. that he's actually been trying to hide it. That he's scarred by it. So many little things like that. I was so sold from the point of the first boss battle where you fight mm. the stranger, and it 
it's the most draggable Z thing I've seen in a long time. <laughs> and I'm not a big fan of that either. It just, I was just so into it. It just told me, and carrying your little head, mate, on your belt for the whole time. <laughs> just having some guy chatting to you when he's hanging off your ass. Uh, I love how he flags um, incoming attacks as well. He's just sort of like, watch yeah. out, like it's coming from behind you. And um, We should pivot into the mighty Last of Us 2. Uh, ben, Roy, ben Roy, this was your uh, number one, your first game to talk about. Um, what makes Last of Us 2 a big old deal for you? Uh, it's the sequel to my favorite game of all time, for one. I mean, there's bias there. But also, it, I think it's the pinnacle of what Sony, not Sony, uh, Naughty Dog has been building up to their whole cinematic presence for the, all this time. And mm. so far, I think it's the perfect, gameplay-wise, the perfect sort of like combination of everything. I prefer The Last of Us 1 to Last of Us 2 still. So. But there's just so much about, like, from even... Even the little touches like crawling down and hiding underneath a car, like I feel like you'd never really be able to just go underneath a car in games and it makes sense. Like, screw it, I just get into the car <laughs> and like, you can't see me. And yeah, sure, it's got a lot of the old long grass, but there is so much <laughs> to this game where I just I eventually begrudgingly cared about everyone in the end, even though I hated a certain <laughs> someone. And I feel like we can reason. definitely talk about that stuff um, because, like, that's obviously the the big pivot. I think I, I, pretty much everybody who's going to care about Last of Us Two story will have yeah. played through to this point. If you haven't, spoilers for like light spoilers for the Last of Us Two. In as much as they do a pivot halfway through where you switch protagonists and you're suddenly playing as new character called Abby, um, who is responsible for a big old event. Um, and that's the biggest thing. That's the reason that a lot of people hate it. Um, and I can totally get that. My whole thing was that all of that is meant to be intentional. You're supposed to hate, you're supposed to forgive, or you're supposed to at least see that Abby is human as well. Um, and that's the thing that's weird because that's what over time has made me kind of sour on it a little bit in terms of um, Abby sections, I feel like drag on a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and I remember all of us saying that when we were playing through it, just being like, oh, I want to get back to the main character. I want to get back to Ellie. Um, but the point is that you're supposed to be forced to see someone else's perspective. You wouldn't have that if they didn't force you to. I feel yeah, like totally. they should have... Oh, sorry, you first, Brown. No, sorry, Pedro. Go. I feel like they should have cut between what was going on more rather than big chunk here, big chunk here. It just felt like a whole giant slab of something else dropped in mm. front of me. You know, I thought I was near the end. As everyone says, we, you think you're near the, at the end of the game. And then there's a whole nother game. Yeah. Now, I'm, it's great value for money, but at the same time, it just was such a sort of <laughs> left turn. Like, nope, sorry. And it pulled me out, even though I thoroughly enjoyed a lot of Abby's sequences. A uh, bit, bit puzzled why she doesn't carry a knife like Ellie, but for the whole point. <laughs> she's got guns, mate, even when she's not picking them up. She's yeah. Got guns. <laughs> she's got guns. And people hate that as well. But <laughs> for, it's just, for me, it was a bit of an abrupt stop. And even though I wouldn't say, like, I've forgiven the game, I feel like I know what the game was going for, mm -hmm. but I don't want to, I don't want to harass anyone online for it. And I still think it's a solid, like, nine out of 10 for me or something like that. I, mm -hmm. I think it's. For me, what I want out of a video game, story, uh, gameplay, I, give, give me stealth wherever I can get it. Give me some zombies wherever I can get them, and I don't care. They're zombies. Mm -hmm. uh, it ticks all the boxes. I'm just going to say that. It ticks everything for me, and to continue saying that I was so precious to me, I, I just love it. I love it. You how, know, how have you found it over time? Uh, honestly, man, like a, a lot of people might not like this, and I am, to be fair, I'm a bit sick of talking about The Last of Us Part 2. I feel like, you know, <laughs> Partly, uh, the discourse has kind of soured a little bit, but like outside of that, I, I've played this game twice now. Like It's the only game, potentially ever, that I've finished, had a week in between, and then thought, I want to play that again. I want to go back to see what experience that again. Partly because of what you were saying, because I feel like in the moment, you do get those kind of sections where you're like, oh, come on, I want to go back to Ellie. I want to see mm -hmm. where this goes. I just want to consume the story. And that is partly intentional, but also an undeniable fault for some people. A lot of people can't get past that. Mm -hmm. So the second time around, I got to enjoy the progression of the story a bit more and the characters a bit more, knowing everything and knowing where it was leading up to. And I didn't have those same issues with the second half because I just, I genuinely enjoyed spending time with, you know, Abby and Lev and those other supporting characters. Mm -hmm. uh, so it made me appreciate the sections that I might have been a bit iffy on you know from a pacing standpoint not necessarily a story i was always on board with a story standpoint i mean mm -hmm. you know how the game is kind of structured and framed the mm -hmm. second time around any potential worries i might have had were just kind of like completely gone and well, I, I, again it, it sucks because like the discourse has soured and i feel like just saying that you like the game opens you up to like a bunch of dislikes and stuff but whatever like yeah those 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 people exist for everything you could change your style of shoe and there would be some someone campaigning that you've got it wrong or you've done it done it wrong Speaking or whatever of, 
Yes. Ellie has really good shoes in The Last of Us Part She does, to be honest. Converse, like they, they, I've got a pair of Converse back there that are exactly the same. <laughs> and man, they get bloody rough after one <laughs> yeah. outing. So if you're in a post-apocalyptic story, I don't know how she's keeping them so pristine. It's very good there point. Is, there is a whole, whole game, to be honest. There's a whole point when Dina scolds her for wearing Converse's as well. So it's like, why are you wearing, con- <laughs> why are you wearing in canvas shoes? But I just want to quickly add to Josh's point before I hand it to Scott. Mm-hmm. Uh, the whole point of doing that second run, I gave it about four days in between. That first run, me playing it, it almost like broke me in some way emotionally. <laughs> it's, the sad, yeah. it's the saddest I felt all year. Regardless, like, I mean, it's been as sad as it is, but I was just so down and I couldn't get out of that. And then I went through again, did the game through again, kind of knew what was coming. Uh, I got the platinum. I think getting the platinum might have just fixed me, saved me from the <laughs> despair. But going through again and understanding what was coming, uh-huh. I kind of, the game sat a lot better with me in the end. And I didn't just feel so, just so wretched and dirty and oh, so you, white by, at the end. By the end of it, I like it's emotionally raw because I think the point that they're going for is look how much people can't forgive each other. Look how much there's a complete lack of understanding and look how much we can't just try and have a conversation and figure each other out. And that thing was so innately sad on like a human level on a primal level because of everything that's going on right now and has done for the last few years and whatever. And you know, the, the wider sort of like socio political landscape, but by the end of it, I was just completely raw because of that. And then I thought, but I did think the game was saying like, look, it's like holding up this giant flag just for like positivity. And, you know, throughout the game, you come across different things. Like it promotes nature and you come across different animals and like the value of community and friendships and things like that. And so like, it is really grimy and they really drag you down to the mud. But I think it's to make an overall positive message. It's just that the game is so unyielding and it's so like grim and they you know they put you through hell yeah. and that bit when they switched to abby is so jarring as well i i've never wanted to destroy something as much as i have the character <laughs> of abby <laughs> and even by the end i because they had both suffered i felt like the same i was willing right. to i i felt like ellie i felt like i was willing to walk away but the whole time i was like i'm killing every last one of them like that really? game it took me over yeah it just took me over that's good i mean that's what they wanted you to do i felt like as soon as you come as soon as the abby section starts i was like i see what you guys are doing oh the dogs have all got names are they? yeah i see exactly what you're doing <laughs> and um and some uh, my my part of it was because you then have to be in abby shoes for 10 hours just being like okay what else have you got um and it's not until they flesh the world out more and you find out about the seraphites and the wlf and the way that they work and like sort of breeding hate through military and religion and it's it's this much bigger co- um you know comment on factional sort of disputes and tribalistic mentalities yeah it's like a, it's a final point i will say that going into into the last of us 2 i didn't want it to, it to be a game about different characters i didn't want it to be about the factions the fireflies because I, I just none of that resonated with me in the first game and i just mm. wanted another ellie, ellie and joel story but going into the second game it made me realize how much interesting stuff is in the last of us world like i cared so much about what was going on between the wlf and the seraphites in a way that i just didn't expect to and i was there right. that, that made me more kind of fine with it kind of expanding the world a bit because i was like okay maybe i should have trusted you maybe maybe uh, i should have invested more in the, the world of the last of us outside of these two characters and their kind of friends and family well i love i was just i was just i really love the way that they they don't necessarily reframe it but they sort of like you know reiterate what the fireflies stand for and like you know when abby says to lev like you're my people it's not about picking a specific faction it's trying to do the best for everybody that was such a great takeaway thing as well it's almost like they're fleshing the world out for some Mm. sort of series that's going to be coming (laughs) almost like it's gonna it's gonna be really helpful to some someone like hbo no 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 (laughs) mr craig mazin um josh your second game to highlight was bloodborne and we are actually i was gonna say we're drastically running out of time we're not running out of that much time but what were your thoughts on uh, bloodborne that's at your number two spot bloody love bloodborne scott it doesn't get enough recognition does bloodborne Bloodborne, when these lists comes up like every when we talk about the best PS4 games, people are like, "Oh, Uncharted, Spider Man, Horizon, God of War," and I'm like, "No, Bloodborne is so good <laughs> because um, even though it is, you know, very much in the same vein as the the Dark Souls um, mold of kind of structure when it comes to the world design and the combat and stuff like that, it's very familiar if you played mm. a Souls game. Like for me, and it, again, this like this is a very personal list for all of us. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's not like we're saying now these are the very best games of all time. That's what uh, I'm saying. The, well, that's what you guys it costs. Yeah. The the world of um, Bloodborne for me is just it's richer than Dark Souls for me because it, it taps into an element of horror that I didn't expect at all going into it, mm. and I got so much out of um, afterwards. Like I still now, years after the fact, I played it at launch, and then I played it again a few years later. I'm still watching 
analyses and critiques of the world and what's really going on because the way it pivots from that kind of gothic Bram Stoker horror into this Lovecraftian cosmic nightmare towards the end of the game. I just thought that was so genius and something that I didn't expect and initially did not want. But right. it's it, it, it opens so many different possibilities and got me invested in the mythology in the world um, in a way that I just haven't been for many games across this generation. I feel like the ones that I picked out for this list have been have had worlds that I've been able to just completely dive into and pick apart in a way that I don't normally do it alongside mm-hmm. really great gameplay. And that combined with the really great gameplay, like the things they added, like the um, the uh, the counter attack gun, the the new dash, the uh, the hunter weapons, which just look so sick. Even the, oh, the transforming weapons, yeah, the transform weapons. Even the chalice dungeons, which I thought were quite an inventive idea, even if I didn't engage with it that much. Mm-hmm. It just it it. It, it clicked, and if I had to choose between that and Dark Souls, I, like the first Dark Souls, I genuinely couldn't do it. But right. fortunately, Dark Souls was last gen, so I don't have to do that. <laughs> and now I could just say Bloodborne, really good. Is you're not wrong. I was going to say Benro, because I think you you clicked with Bloodborne as well, whereas I just didn't at all, but it's because I came I... from Souls. I was very, yeah, it's Dark Souls, hard game, demons uh, are hard. It's that hard game, you just want to be one. hard. You, you fall off the side a lot. And then I played Blood, <laughs> Blood, Blood, Bloodborne. And it just, just just took me. And it took me to the point where I was doing this this thing. Is it this? The way sun that? stance? Yeah. <laughs> then did that. Uh, the Blood Star Beast. The uh, Blood Star Beast put me to hell and back and basically taught me how to play that game. And got I played I loved it enough, I got the platinum. I just I'd never played something where I I just love a good dodge in the game. You see, if only <laughs> if only their sequel, the game afterwards, Sekiro, like a superior, like an inferior game in almost every way, had well, a decent like dodge, <laughs> and wasn't all about big men with sticks. It would actually be good. But Ben Wright's Bloodborne... campaign against men with sticks has gone across multiple games. I now. mean, Go- Ghost of Tsushima's got that. For that I almost swore that it's got that problem as well. It's got it's got a huge stick, stick in it. Yeah, but. Uh... <laughs> Uh, Bloodborne, yeah, really good game, and I can't really say anything else that Josh hasn't, apart from, yeah, Bloodstar Beast. My thing with, um, yeah, I, I'm not going to, um, I think Bloodborne is this like immaculate creation if you didn't come straight from Souls, but like for me, I, I was I just came from like Dark Souls 2, um, and I just remember thinking like, oh, it's just it's just Souls with a dodge, and I it's just, just couldn't. It's just, it, it's just better in every way, though, so it's just better. It's fascinating that Scott because I, I did something similar. Um, I didn't play Dark Souls two, but I just played Dark Souls the first one for the first time it, like six months or so before Bloodborne came out. So I went right. straight from that to that, and I was just like, "Yes, give me more of this. <laughs> give me the the thing I've just enjoyed in an mm-hmm. in an equally exciting world with a new kind of twist on the gameplay. Give oh, it- me more." It's totally my fault because I OD'd on that formula because it was it was like 2013-ish when there wasn't... Oh, sorry, 2014. And um, when there wasn't that many titles coming out at the beginning of the year and I went from the first Dark Souls straight into uh, Lords of Fallen, into Dark Souls 2, into Bloodborne. <laughs> and I was just like, I have burned myself out. And uh, I still thought Bloodborne is an immaculate creation and I love the Lovecraftian stuff like you mentioned, but the game overall didn't grab me. Like, I know it has with so many other people. Um, to move on to fair. another um, choice, can though. Can, uh, my, can, oh, go on. I was just say, can we just definitely forever... Bloodborne or Sekiro, vote now, Josh, because you wasn't on that podcast. Um, <laughs> Bloodborne, but Sekiro's there great. We got Bloodborne oh! is the greatest of all time. Besides with the stick, man. I'm going <laughs> to go with Sekiro. It's a tighter game. With newer mechanics, my second uh, choice is Ghost of Tsushima, which I still, I finished it last night. That game, I, I don't know, I'm fighting to say that's my game of the year, mainly because Ori is like gradually sort of firing up the ranks the more I go back to that game. But Tsushima is just so immaculately developed and so it's so many design choices that favor the player. Um, from like the, you know, you choose your own progression, you choose exactly which missions you want to do, you know what you're going to get, but you always have that forward through line of like what you're supposed to be doing and what you're supposed to be getting to. Um, the story itself, I think, is one of the best open world stories ever. Like it's it, that oh, genre is yeah. not known for great stories. Um, and the character as well there's some straight up mass effect to everyone coming together everyone pitching in styles energy and that stuff i didn't expect at all um and it's when it makes that pivot towards the end of act two where it's like oh we're all in this together and everyone's like championing uh championing uh fighting kotal khan uh, or Khan. Khan's to do for mortal kombat um trying to sort of save the island 
I I just love it. I absolutely love every single aspect of it. I don't know if you're the, still the same, Josh, because you're not finished Dude, just yet. Like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not finished it yet, but I must have played it. I've played it for over 30 hours. I probably played mm. 30 hours alone last week. You know, I've fully cleared the first area, fully cleared the second area, and mm -hmm. I'm just starting Act 3, which is why I didn't feel it was totally fair for me to rate it on this thing right now. But uh. like Death Stranding, I have been living and breathing this. I've been playing it every night until the early hours because I'm just so invested <laughs> in the kind of like gameplay loop and the way it encourages you to explore the world. But like you said, the story is something mm. I just wasn't expecting. And these characters, the side characters especially, doing their missions and uh, kind of like following their threads and getting to know more about them it has engaged me in a way that I just didn't expect when I first jumped into it. I thought the story kind of, the setup was a little bit rote. These side characters fit neatly into archetypes. But the mm. further you get into the game, I feel like it does some really interesting things with them that are actually really emotionally affecting. Like I was mm. playing a part on Sunday morning that just set the day up for a fail because it was so well done. <laughs> it was such this, it was this touching, quiet scene that you wouldn't get in like an Assassin's Creed and not to just slag that off. But I feel like they wouldn't have the time for something as slow and plodding as these couple of missions. And I played mm. them and it was had such a great payoff with his character that it's essentially just been introduced as well. And I thought, man, like this game has something special. It's making me feel things and it's just coming together in a mechanical and story driven way in a way that I just I didn't expect. I always thought it was going to be a solid, you know, seven or eight out of ten, but it mm. has genuinely been elevated to the point of, you know, I think it's probably my second favorite game of the year at the moment. Like, that's in, yeah, that's kind of where it's sitting for me. It's I I, I don't even, that's mainly some of my recency bias talking, but it's having since finished Sushima, and I, I initially did the games of the year so far, the video that's up on the channel before Sushima came out. Um so there's that too. But um Ben Roy, where do you where are you sitting on Sushima? I know you're not as big of a fan as me and Josh are. It's um there are certain fundamental things about the game that I just don't like. Sticks. Uh, I, I I there are <laughs> It's a lot of sticks. I, I, to be I will say that when did we decide, as sort of like in the industry, that someone with a stick needs you can only <laughs> defeat them in one way, and you can't <laughs> just defeat them like a normal guy. But well, it depends that, on how many stances you're switching between, mate. There's there's four of them, isn't there? That aside, uh, I wish there was a mini map. I'm not going to go into more than that because <laughs> we could be there for forever. If if, the, um, if any if the world could see the WhatsApp thread that me, Ben Roy, and Josh have, the amount of of that Ben Roy is hating that you can't look at a mini map. You're not alone. Other people do wish they could see that stuff too. I I, um, I love the wind mechanic though. I do this. So here we do. Say that. Good for an audio Love podcast. This. Yeah, the people yeah. on the audio podcast. Uh, he's gone into the story. background. He's retrieving something. He now has so, a controller. This is me. I'm playing Ghost of Shima like this. But I'm, when I'm riding, this is me the whole time. Swiping I'm, the touchpad. I feel like Because when I wasn't doing, You're doing it wrong. When I wasn't doing <laughs> it at the beginning, I was going around the, the, the hill and going the wrong side. I was like, but to be fair, that was more in the first area. In the second area, there's a lot less. It feels a lot more flat. The like the the landscape, so it's not as like sort of harsh for going the wrong way around. Mm -hmm. There are some things that, like I want to drop down the ledge that I know I if I just was to walk off it, I wouldn't die. But <laughs> he Jin just won't go over it, so I have yes. to jump. We and then jump. he falls. Then he falls to his knees and goes Ugh, and almost not dies. Press circle, mate. It, you, <laughs> can, you can roll out of it. Yeah, yeah. Now you can, but not at the very beginning. And <laughs> you got used to it. I think I don't, I think I need to, as satisfying as it is, like mechanically satisfying, clearing, like I've done everything like Josh in the bottom section and I mm. start to get the middle one, but I'm, I think I'm going to stop that now and just try and proceed with the sort of the, the blue, the silver and the gold quest things. But, that yeah, you, you definitely want like a good mix of all three. Like I sort of, I did like two or three missions of the character ones and I did all of the uh, the blue ones, which is where you get specific armor upgrades or the specific, like the long bow and stuff like that. Um, but the gold ones are yeah. the main story campaign missions, which I would say like you want one of them sort of every four or five of the other missions. Um, I know Josh, you cleared everything out, whereas I eventually did. I've like I hit credits last, credits last night and now I'm going back over to go regroup with like Masako, uh, Masako or um, Ishikawa or whoever. Um, to finish out the rest of their storylines, which I know to you seems crazy because you've been ramping everything up in order. Oh, that was a oh. madness to me, Scott Tilford. You <laughs> tell me that you'd only played a couple in the first act. Like, it's not a couple. Month. I've done the last three or four. That's insane. Yeah. It's three not. Four, because to, honestly, like to me, that's that's the best content for as good as the main story. You've not seen get. what happens, mate. Well, I know, I know, I know. But so far, you've not seen what happens in the side content. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, is it? I've been chasing <laughs> foxes the whole time. <laughs> They're really that, good foxes. That, that, can, that can deal one after a while. But like for me, furthering <laughs> those threads with those characters made the 
main narrative more impactful because I had an investment in them. You do get an mm -hmm. investment anywhere because you do see them around the main missions, but knowing about their backstory, knowing that I've helped them, they've helped me, it just made that bond a bit tighter in, yeah. like you said, the same way it does in Mass Effect. Like you can go through Mass Effect 2 uh, and still have an affection for these side characters, but I feel like you get that extra appreciation and literal extra loyalty by doing their missions and learning more about them. Like there mm -hmm. are some stuff in the... Uh, Masako one, for instance, uh, that is some of my favorite parts of like the whole game. Like uh, some mm. of those missions, I just love that where they went and what they revealed about the characters. So it is a bit crazy to me, but as long as you get, to, as long as you do them eventually, I'm all right with it. I don't mind when you do it. I think it's just the thing with me with um, that game is just that it feels like an amalgam of all the best sort of like there's a lot of sucker punches like veteran uh, design traits all over it. like they know how to front like there's hardly any loading in it they tell you what award's going to be at a certain place before you get there um, or you know, like when you're walking after an NPC you sort of dictate the speed that they go at all these little quality of life improvements that you didn't realize other games were missing um, and it's just it's got this Breath of the Wild sensibility to its open world but it kind of borrows just enough of Assassin's Creed stealth mechanics but then you have this really great meaty combat system and the story is fantastic as well it's just i think it comes together better than it almost had any right to and it, it yeah. elevates so much more there's so much heart to it um so yeah that would be mine um ben Roy, your uh, second game to talk about was until dawn which rounds us out on this pod until dawn is lovely it's, it's like one of the nicest horror experiences i've had where just some dumb teens are going to a to a cabin <laughs> and then was well, there any other kind and then are they all gonna die they're all gonna survive or are some gonna die it's up to you and just this is a game that I have taken and played with friends and like partners before and then just the people that don't play games a lot as well, just watch them mm. get to it straight away and experience it or watch me play it like a movie and then making the decision and just being, it's a game that I show people and kind of like amaze them by a bit. Like look at this game it's basically, a, it's, it's a movie and it <laughs> is unlike the David Cage stuff. And <laughs> mm -hmm. I, cared about like there are some characters like you just got monked by uh i can't remember his name now but just some just just some lad jumping out dressed up as a monk and it's scary <laughs> the first time and then the second time the third time you're you just thinking monk. about getting monked and i'm not gonna get monked in a bit but it's coming and then as it goes on it gets a bit more serious and scary there is the tension and i don't buy the whole uh the, people hate the control a bit where if you don't you gotta hold it, it still you've it's not hold it still, but you've also got to move it a bit as well because mm. if you just hold it completely still if you put it on the side it then kills you because mm. they knew that you would just do that but which i think wasn't done as well in the one afterwards i can't remember what it's called oh the dark anthology yes i, I think that wasn't done as well there but this is nah. for me the pinnacle of that style of game and the cinematic presence of just like a fun horror movie and yeah just well, like, I mean, Stop. how underused are, is teen horror in video games? Like, you hardly ever see it. Like, there's there's bits and pieces of it in, like, Dead by Daylight, or my mind goes to, like, uh, I think it's called Obscure on the PS2. Um, but you hardly ever just see, like, a group of teens with a game that indulges in teen horror that's self-aware with yeah. it and has characters almost, like, scream style being like, oh, I'll be right back, and, like, you follow them or whatever. <laughs> um, that's kind of the tone that I felt like Until Dawn had, but you're behind the controls and the decisions every step of the way. So, you know, like, on multiple playthroughs, you can, you can pretty much... Uh, sure that everyone survives i think bar like two people um, you can and be different endings there's like eight people that are decided where they could live or die you can kill right. them all off or save them all and um i, I did it all because i just loved it <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the, everyone who's cast in that is great, like Rami Malek and um, Hayden Plantier, and it's just it's a it's a great mid two thousands teen cast as well. And it's the whole oh, Oscar oh, winner oh. Rami Malek is in yeah. that game. Like, <laughs> Freddie Mercury himself. And also the fixed camera angles just gave me a nice like, like yelled Resident Evil vibe mm. of walking around this big house and not really knowing and having the creators direct me where they wanted me to look and sort of things and. Like, I miss that, that, that man. Also, I, that also helped me get monked as well. So <laughs> the monk detector was uh, was spiking. If there was one thing to bring back in horror, I would totally campaign for fixed perspectives. I miss them. I think they could be done extremely well. Um, Josh, what are your thoughts on Until Dawn in general, though? Yeah, dude, it's it's sick. Like you said, it has a total mastery over that teen horror genre. It mm. it, it uh, elevates a lot of the mechanical focuses. I think that a lot of these interactive storytelling games try. For me, it's just. It makes David Cage's, you know, Quantic Dream games look like just like kids stuff, like kids' first video game. You know what I mean? I just feel <laughs> right. like 
uh, compared to like the the storytelling in those titles, it's just it's so much tighter, and it has such a like I said a mastery over the characters and the genre and the story it's trying to tell. And it, it sucks a bit because I feel like the developers haven't made a game to that level since. No. And I wonder whether until Dawn was a one off. Because I remember when it came out, I thought, right, this is the future of this subgenre. If, if if everything else isn't an until Dawn, we've gone down. And I don't think there has been a game like that. As no, good as just Man of Medan, but it came that out. was just Man of Medan. But again, for me, that didn't work. They're, like it's got a neat little co op vibe to it, but it just. The production quality is not there for them, for me. And it's yeah. too condensed, and they're promising more. And I say condensed is like, we all like quick games, but it just felt like there wasn't enough time to get used mm. to it or want to care about anything. Whereas mm -hmm. Until Dawn, by the end, it's great. And also Until Dawn is a game that you could play in a night. Sit, get some friends down, do whatever you want, like on a spooky night, and just play it all the way through. It's great. Mm -hmm. It's it's a, a four like devoted single player game. It's one of the best multiplayer games you could ever play. Like everybody's <laughs> reacting to all the. There's so many twists and turns in that story. There's all, the whole flashback thing. Um, the whole like you know the idea that you're, that you're finding out what's happening in the story from multiple perspectives and different characters. Yeah, there's a ton to that stuff. Um, but yeah, there, there's, this would be our sort of roundup of all the best PS4 exclusives of the generation. I was gonna say so far, but that's it. They're the best PS4 exclusives of the generation. There's nothing else coming out for the rest of this year. Um, so let us know your favorites down in the comments below or come find us on social media if you're listening along on any of the audio platforms um, and let us know what you think. For now, this has been the What Culture Gaming Podcast. I've been your host, Scott Hilford, joined by Ben Roy Turner. Goodbye. And Josh Brown. Goodbye. I will catch you next time. See Bye. Ya. Don't get monked. <laughs> <laughs> Never get monked.